Good day everyone. So this topic is a continuation of the previous discussion that we had in the steroid hormones, particularly the sex hormones. So we will have the laboratory evaluation of reproductive function. So to start with, we have here the categories of reproductive diseases. So these reproductive diseases can be classified as either hormonal deficiency or hormonal excess. So that means there is a decrease or increased productions of the hormones respectively. And also, it could be classified as primary or secondary dysfunction. So in primary dysfunction, the problem is in the gonads. So it's either in the testes or in the ovaries. So testes or ovaries. So that's primary dysfunction. Whereas in the secondary dysfunction, the problem lies in the pituitary gland. So, if the problem is primary, then these testes or these ovaries might be producing excess or deficient amount of hormones. Whereas, if the problem is in secondary, um, secondary gland or it's a secondary dysfunction, then this anterior pituitary might be producing excess or hormone levels that are not enough. And also, you have to take note of this one. So, in primary dysfunction, the steroid levels in the gonads or the hormone levels in the gonads are inversely related to the gonadotropin level in your pituitary gland. So what do I mean by that one? So for example, the problem is a primary dysfunction. So meaning to say these testes or these ovaries are producing increased or decreased amounts of hormones. So if the production is increased, that would send a feedback to the pituitary gland to decrease the production of gonadotropin hormones. That's why they are inversely related. However, if the production is decreased or deficient, that would also send signal to the pituitary gland to increase the production of this gonadotropin level. So that's why they are inversely related. However, in the secondary dysfunction, you have to take note that the steroid hormones in the gonads, the levels of these hormones, are directly related to the gonadotropin levels of the pituitary gland. So in secondary dysfunction, where is the problem? So the problem is in the pituitary gland. So if this pituitary gland is producing an increased amount of hormones, or increased amounts of gonadotropin hormones, that would also increase the production of the steroid hormones in the ovaries and the testes. That's why they are directly related or directly proportional. However, if this anterior uh, pituitary gland cannot produce enough amounts of hormones, that will also lead to the decreased production of hormones in the gonads. So that's why they are directly related. Now, let's have the evaluation of male reproductive function. So, as what you can see here, the most common procedure performed in the laboratory to determine the male reproductive function is the semen analysis or the analysis of seminal fluid. So, this is routinely done in the laboratory because this is very cost-effective and this is a very simple procedure. And also, um, I have to emphasize the two terms, the semen and the sperms. So take note of this one. So when we say sperms, they are the cells that we can see in the semen or the cells that we can see in the seminal fluid. So they're the ones that you can see moving there in this illustration. Whereas when we say semen or seminal fluid, it's a cumulative term for the fluid that contains the sperm and also other substances. So remember that one because these two terms are often used interchangeably, but they are totally different. And also we have here the semen fractions and composition. So we have here the fractions and their percentages. So each fraction differs in its composition. And the mixing of all these four fractions during ejaculation is very important for the production of a normal semen specimen. So when we say ejaculation, so it refers to the release of semen from the male reproductive tract 
as a result of orgasm. So that's ejaculation. So we have here the parts of the male reproductive system that contributes to the fraction of seminal fluid. So first we have the testis that contains the spermatozoa, so that's 5%. And also we have here your seminal vesicles which contribute to 60 to 70% of the semen fractions. Also another one, we have the prostate, so that's 20 to 30% the prostatic fluid. Next one, we have here the bulbo-urethral gland. Again, that contributes to 5% of the semen fractions. So what are the importance of semen analysis? So first, for the evaluation of reproductive dysfunction, particularly infertility. Also, the selection of donors for therapeutic insemination and in medical legal cases where paternity is being questioned or disclaimed on the basis of male sterility. So when we say sterility, it refers to the inability to produce or to release sperm that could also lead to the inability to impregnate a woman. And also, this semen analysis helps in the monitoring of the success of the different procedures such as varicoselectomy and vasectomy. So first, let's have the varicocelectomy. So what is a varicocele? So this varicocele is a vein that is enlarged in the sputum. So in short, that is an enlarged scrotal vein. So a scrotum is the pouch of the skin that holds the testicles. So as um, opposed to this one, so this is a normal vein in the testicle. So this one, this is a varicocele. So when this varicocele develops in the scrotum, it can block the blood flow to the rest of the reproductive system. So that can be now a source of male infertility, pain, and could even impair the production of hormones such as the testosterone. So when we say varicocelectomy, it's the surgical removal of this varicocele or enlarged veins. And the purpose of this procedure is in order to restore the proper blood flow to the reproductive organs. So you have here a picture of a microsurgical varicocelectomy. So it's performed um, under a high-powered operating microscope, of course, to eliminate the side effects and the risk of the procedure. And also, this varicocelectomy has two approaches. So it's either inguinal or subinguinal. So this one, this is a subinguinal approach of varicocelectomy. Next one. So, what you can see here is that um, the surgeon incises the skin and dissects down the spermatic cord. And that is where the abnormal veins are encountered. And each of the vein is meticulously dissected and then tied off to disrupt the flow. And of course, to provide drainage of blood away from the testicles into the inner thigh and into the pelvis. So this one also shows varicocelectomy procedure wherein there is an exposure of the subinguinal varicocele. So it will be repaired and um, there is this instrument, this one. So this is what we call as the Penrose drain. So it's a soft and flexible tube that is made usually of latex. So this Penrose drain the tongue depressor is inserted in it. So this is the initial look and then the tongue depressor is inserted and it is used as a platform and then placed beneath the spermatic cord. So this procedure is to expose the entire structure, of course, to prepare for the main varicocelectomy procedure. Also this one, so the veins are sutured after the procedure and then the varicocele is repaired completely. How about this one, vasectomy? So in this surgical procedure, as what you can see in the illustration, the doctor makes a cut in the scrotum to reach the vas deferens. That's why we call it vasectomy, because we are cutting or severing the vas deferens or vasa deferentia. Anyway, the vas deferens, the main function of that is it carries the sperm from the testis towards the urethral duct of the penis. So that's also one method of contraception. So in this picture, um, you can see here a conventional vasectomy. 
So again, for the conventional vasectomy, there is an incision that is made. So that's on each side of the scrotum to reach the vas deferens. Whereas for the no scalpel vasectomy, the doctor would just peel the vas deferens under the scrotum and he or she will use a clamp just like this one to hold it in place. And by the use of this needle or specialized forceps, they will make a tiny hole in the skin and then stretch it open and lift each vas deferens out. So they will cut it and then seal it with a steering, stitches, or they could do both. So just like this one. And also, these are the different approaches of vasectomy procedure. So again, the main difference between the no scalpel vasectomy and the conventional vasectomies is how the surgeon would access the vas deferens. So how would we instruct the patient to properly collect the semen sample? So first, there must be a three-day period of sexual abstinence. So that's coming from Henry's 22nd edition. However, from the 5th edition of the Book of Strassinger, so the specimens or the semen sample are collected following a period of sexual abstinence from 2 to 3 days to not more than 5 days. So that's from Strassinger. However, if we get the, uh, if we get the average of these 2 to 3 days, it would still give us 2.5 days, which is equivalent to 3 days. And as stated in here, longer periods of abstinence usually result in a higher semen volume. So the volume will be increased, but then the sperm motility will be reduced or will be decreased. So in such a case, a second semen specimen may be collected 2 hours after the first sample is collected. And also... The patient must be instructed that his bladder must be evacuated, must be emptied before ejaculation occurs. And also, there is this substance, flavin. So this flavin gives semen a yellowish color to so this one. How about for the specimen container? So for semen collection, the laboratory should give the patient a warm sterile glass or plastic containers with a screw top. Usually, it is pre-weighed. And the semen should be kept warm during transport, but if it is not appropriate, the specimen should be kept at room temperature and delivered to the laboratory within one hour of collection. And that the, the time of collection and the time of receipt in the laboratory must also be recorded. How about for the specimens awaiting analysis? So, it must be kept at 37 degrees Celsius. And also, we have here the ART. So, this is a procedure. So, it's assisted reproductive technology. So, we will discuss that later. So, um, it includes in vitro fertilization. So, these kinds of procedures require that a motil sperm, so take note of that one, motil sperm be isolated from a seminal plasma within one hour of ejaculation to protect the sperm from the inhibitory effects of seminal plasma on fertilization. So that's again for ART. How about for the methods of collection? So for the methods of collection, masturbation or self-production is preferred. So this ensures that the entire um, ejaculation is collected. But also, elastic condom can be used. This can be done through masturbation or a non-lubricant containing Polymeric silicon condoms can also be used. But um, you have to take note that ordinary condoms are not acceptable because they have spermicidal properties. So they would kill the sperm. And then also, coitus interruptus, or we could refer it as a withdrawal method. And also, aspiration of a seminal fluid from the vaginal vault after coitus or after sexual intercourse. Next one. A post-ejaculate urine sample, so take note of this, it's a urine sample. Post-ejaculate urine sample may be collected if retrograde ejaculation is suspected. So in this case, two specimens must be collected within two to three week intervals and that, uh, that must be used for evaluation and 
if they are markedly different, additional specimens should be collected. So again, that's for retrograde ejaculation. So what is a retrograde ejaculation? So as what you can see in the picture, you have here a normal, so this one, you have here a normal flow of the semen. So in retrograde ejaculation, um, the semen enters the bladder instead of emerging or flowing to the penis during an orgasm. However, even though um, the male can still reach sexual climax in this condition, he might ejaculate very little or no semen at all. And this is sometimes called dry orgasm. So this is not harmful, but it can cause male infertility. How about for fertility testing? So for fertility testing, two or three samples are usually tested at two to three weeks interval. So that's for fertility testing. And um, two abnormal results are already considered significant. But for WHO, so for World Health Organization, it's still two to three samples collected, not less than seven days or more than three weeks. Again, that's for WHO. Now, let us have the macroscopic examination of semen sample. So, you have to take note that a fresh semen sample is clotted. So, that's why you have to perform the macroscopic examination of semen sample after liquefaction. So, that's approximately less than 20 minutes and that's done at room temperature. So the semen sample must also be mixed thoroughly and be examined for its viscosity. And also, if the semen fails to liquefy, that could indicate inadequate prostate secretion. And um, I would want to mention also that the majority of the sperms are found in the first portion of the collected semen. So if there is a missing first portion, the sperm count will decrease, the pH will increase, and the semen will not liquefy. So as opposed to that, the missing last portion, the sperm will increase, pH will decrease, and the semen will not clot. How about for preservation? So I have mentioned this earlier, that during transport, the semen sample must be kept warm. But if it is not possible, it must be kept at room temperature and be delivered to the laboratory within one hour. And for those uh, specimens awaiting for analysis, it must be kept at 37 degrees Celsius. But for artificial insemination, so it can be kept at negative 85 degrees Celsius for one year. And also, just take note that all specimens, semen samples, are discarded as biohazardous waste because all semen specimens are potential reservoirs for HIV and hepatitis viruses. And that standard precautions must be observed at all times during the analysis. About this one, appearance. So the normal appearance of a semen sample is translucent, grayish white. And the odor is musty odor. And then uh, a highly turbid specimen usually contains WBC. So the WBC is greater than 1 million per ML. So this is what we call as pyospermia. So pyospermia, meaning to say more than 1 million white blood cells per 1 milliliter of semen. And because these white blood cells can weaken the sperm, this pyospermia can damage also the genetic material of the sperm. And also other colors, we have brown or red that the, that would indicate that the semen contains RBCs. And also, again, the presence of flavine would lead to yellow coloration of the semen. So, flavine comes from the Latin word flavus, meaning to say yellow. So, the, the appearance of um, a yellow hue also, aside from the, the presence of flavine, can be associated with pyospermia. And a rust color with small bleedings um, in the seminal vesicle also can be seen or can be observed for the appearance of the semen sample. 
Next one, volume. So for the volume, the normal uh, volume is 2 to 5 ml. So this is measured using graduated cylinders or serologic pipette calibrated in 0 0.1 ml increments. And according to the 22nd edition of Henry also, the volume of ejaculate can be measured by weighing the collection cup before and after specimen collection. So that's also another way of measuring the volume of the semen. So for prolonged abstinence, it could lead to increased volume. However, for decreased volume, it is associated with infertility and it may indicate improper functioning of one of the semen producing glands. Next one, viscosity. So the normal semen is slightly viscous, so it pours in droplets. However, if there is increased viscosity and incomplete liquefaction, that will now impede the motility of the sperms. And also this one, droplets that form threads longer than 2 cm is already considered highly viscous. So um, the incompletely liquefied specimens are usually clumped and highly viscous. So that is the measurement of it. And also, the ratings of 0 to 4 can be used for viscosity, uh, viscosity reports. So, 0 for watery and then 4 for gel-like semen sample. So, other books would also tell us that we could report it as low, normal, or high viscosity. How about for pH? So, the normal pH is 7.2 to 8. And the pH should be measured within one hour of ejaculation due to the loss of carbon dioxide that occurs. So if the carbon dioxide is lost um, in the semen sample, what will happen is it will lead to an alkaline semen. So it will increase the pH of the semen sample. And also, if the pH of um, semen is increased, so it could also indicate infection. And if it is decreased, there is um, increased prostatic fluid or there might be ejaculatory duct obstruction or poorly developed seminal vesicles. So another one, if the pH is greater than 8 or higher, it could indicate infection in the prostate, um, seminal vesicle, or epididymis. However, if the pH is 7 or below, it could indicate contamination with urine or an obstruction with the ejaculatory ducts or if the specimen consists of prostatic fluid. So that's the seven. So this one shows the summary of the parameters of the semen samples and their normal values. Now let's have the determination of sperm concentration. So this quantitative determination is done with the use of a hemocytometer or a new Bauer chamber. So I hope you still remember its principle in hematology. So also indicated in here, the commonly used dilution is 1 is to 20. And the two frequently used methods are the following. So it's either you count the sperm in 5 RBC squares or in two large WBC squares. And of course, before counting the sperm, must be immobilized. So by the use of cold water, sodium bicarbonate, formalin, 4.05% chlorazine, 5.1% formalin in 3% trisodium citrate, and of course, um, stains such as crystal violet can be added to aid in their visualization. And also for the formula, we have for the sperm concentration, and we also have the sperm count. But take note that you can only get the sperm count if you already have the sperm concentration. So for the sperm concentration, it is reported as sperm per ml. So that's sperm counted either in the RBC or the WBC squares multiplied by dilution divided by the area of the squares used multiplied by 0 0.1. So this one refers to the depth of the hemocytometer, so that's 0.1 millimeters. And also, you multiply it with a constant number, which is 1,000. And now, if you already have the sperm concentration, you can already determine the sperm count. 
So that is sperm per ejaculate. So you just have to multiply the sperm concentration with the volume of the semen sample. How about for the normal value? So the normal value of the sperm concentration is greater than 20 million sperm per milliliter. So that's greater than 20 million sperm per ml. So that is normal. So let me just write here normal value. For borderline value, it's between 10 to 20 million sperms per ml. So again, that's a borderline value. How about for the sperm count? So in the sperm count, the normal value, so for this one, it's greater than 40 million sperms per ejaculate. So where um, did we get that 40 million ejaculate? Remember, the normal sperm concentration is 20 ml and the normal um, semen volume is 2 to 5 ml. So that's 20 multiplied by 2, it would give you 40 or 40 million. How about this one? So in order for you not to have that long process for the determination of the sperm concentration and sperm count, we could have this um, shortcut, but this one is for sperm concentration only. So if you use 5 RBC squares, you could multiply the number of sperms counted um, in this 5 RBC squares to 1 million. So that would still give you sperm per ml. Or if you use two large WBC squares, you could um, multiply the number of sperms counted to 100,000. And it would still give you the same normal value. Okay, next one. So this is how the hemocytometer looks like. So I hope you still remember this one. So um, as what you can see here, one large square for WBC, the area of which is 1 by 1 millimeter. So if we use WBC squares for counting, then the area that we would apply for the formula is 1 by 1. Okay, let me just enlarge that one. So I'm talking about this one. So from this point up to this point, that is 1 millimeter. So from this point also to this point, that is also 1 millimeter. So that's 1 by 1. And also, this square at the center of the hemocytometer, it still has the same area. So from this point to this point, that is also 1 millimeter, 1 millimeter. Also this one to this one, that is 1 millimeter, 1 millimeter. But for RBC squares, we will be using only 5 RBC squares. So that means we would divide this 1 millimeter area to 5. So that would give us now 0.2 by 0.2. So this one, so from here to here, and also this one, so that is 0.2 by 0.2 millimeter. So, so if we will use the RBC squares, the area that we are to use is 0 0.2 by 0 0.2. And we multiply it, of course, with the number of squares that we, uh, that we used for um, the, the analysis. Now, let us apply the formula to this um, sample problem. So, based on the given, we have here 1 is the 20 dilution and then volume for ml. 5 RBC squares are used and a total of 60 sperms are counted in that square. So, again, we have first to get the sperm concentration before we get the sperm count. So, what's um, the formula of sperm concentration? So, again, it's reported in sperm per ml. So, that's number of sperms counted multiplied by the dilution divided by the area of the squares used. So, in this case, we used 5 RBC squares. So what will be the area? So it's 0.2 by 0.2. And then multiply it by the depth of the hemocytometer multiplied by 1,000. So that would give us 60 times 20 divided by the area again, 0.2 by 0.2. But this is an area, so we have to multiply it by the number of squares used. So multiply it by 5 times the depth and multiply it by 1,000. So now, 
this would give us 60 million sperm per ml. Or we could just write 60 m sperm per ml. Remember for the shortcut, if we use 5 RBC squares, we can easily uh, multiply the number of sperms counted to 1 million. So in this case, 60 sperms multiplied by 1 million, that would still give us 60 million sperms per ml. So now we can get the sperm count because we already have the sperm concentration. So sperm count is reported as sperm per ejaculate. So that would give us the sperm concentration multiplied by, by the volume. So the sperm concentration of 60 million multiplied by the volume of 4 ml. So that would give us how much? 240 million sperms per ejaculate. So that's how we get the sperm count. Next one. So you have to take note that only fully developed sperms should be counted. So fully developed sperms should be counted and that immature sperm and WBCs, we call them as round cells and they must not be included. So these round cells again should not be included in the counting. However, their presence can be significant and they may need to be identified and counted separately. And also this one, greater than 1 million WBCs per ml. So that again indicates inflammation or infection. I have mentioned this earlier. And for spermatids, so if it is greater than 1 million um, per ml, so that means a disruption of spermatogenesis. So that would be caused by a viral infection, exposure to toxic chemicals, or genetic disorders. Okay, and also you just have to take note that stains um, can also be included in the diluting fluid in order to differentiate immature sperms or what we call as spermatids and also leukocytes. And they can also be counted in the same manner as the um, mature sperms. Now for the sperm motility, it is observed or done in 20 high power fields and the percentage of sperm showing actual forward movement is recorded. And this is also performed in undiluted liquefied specimen and the motility is evaluated based on speed and direction. So this is coming from the 22nd edition of Henry. So the grading is 4, 3, 2, 1, and 0. And also this is the description. So if 4, it's moving rapidly in a straight line with little yaw and lateral movement. 3, if it moves more slowly. 2, if sperm moves even more slowly and with substantial yaw. 1, if they are moving but no forward progression. 0, if they don't have movement at all. This one, this is coming from Strassinger. So this is based on the WHO criteria. So they are still using 43210, but the WHO uses a rating scale of A, B, C, and D. And if it is 4 or A, rapid straight line motility. 3, which refers to slower uh, speed and some lateral movement. 2, slow forward progression and noticeable lateral movement. 1, no forward progression. And 0, no movement at all. So the WHO criteria states that Within one hour, so let me just write that one. So within one hour, 50% or more of the sperm should be motil in categories A, B, and C. Or 25% or more should be motil or show, uh, should show progressive motility in grading A and B. So that's for WHO criteria and also the presence of a high percentage of immobile or non-motil sperm and clumps of sperm must also be noted because this requires further evaluation to determine sperm viability or the presence of sperm agglutinins. So as what you can see here, the sperms are stained. So 
if the motility is less than 50%, for example, upon, upon examination, so if it is less than 50%, a viability stain of AUCIN Y with nigrosin as a counter stain is done. So again, the stains are AUCIN Y, so this is the primary stain, and then we have the nigrosin as the counter stain or the secondary stain. So in this viability stain, so the dead sperm, so the dead sperm, they will stain red. So they will stain red, whereas the viable stain, I mean the viable sperm, will exclude the dye and will appear unstained. So the live sperm, they will be unstained. So in samples, for example, um, with no visible sperm, such as if the patient has um, undergone vasectomy procedure. So in post-vasectomy cases or post-vasectomy semen, the entire sample should be centrifuged and the pellet must be examined for intact or damaged um, sperm fragments. And this analysis of the post-vasectomy semen should be repeated in four to six months. Also, you can see here um, sperms that are motile. So some are having forward movement, some are not moving, and some are also yawning. Also this one, so that's what you can see under the microscope. So again, motility is done on 20 high power fields. Now for the sperm morphology, so this is done by using at least 200 sperms um, and it is read under OIO and um, the neck, the head, the mid piece and the tail are all evaluated. So as what you can see here, any abnormalities in this area could result to poor ovum penetration whereas abnormalities in the tail could lead to abnormal motility of the sperm. And also, this um, sperm morphology can be evaluated using stains. So the recommended stain is the Papa Nicolau stain, but also acceptable results can be obtained by using hematoxylin, crystal violet, and gemsa stain. So for the procedure, so we can use or we could create or we could make smears by using approximately 10 microliters of semen. And that air-dried slide, that air-dried smear is stable for 24 hours. And again, at least 200 sperms should be examined in oil immersion objective. And the percentage of the abnormal forms should also be reported. So for the Kruger's strict criteria, there must be greater than 14% normal sperm morphology. So you will know this later, this strict criteria. So this Kruger's criteria measures the head, the tail, and the acrosomal cup, and it requires a stage micrometer. However, this procedure is not routinely used, but it is recommended by the World Health Organization. How about this one, the round cells? So as mentioned earlier, the immature sperms and WBCs are often referred to as the round cells. Again, in the sperm concentration and the sperm count, that we did earlier, so I have mentioned that these round cells must not be included in the counting because they could be examined separately, especially if they appear numerously in a semen sample. So the formula for that is equal to N multiplied by S over 100. So the N stands for the number of spermatids or immature sperms or neutrophils per 100 sperms. And the S there stands for sperm concentration. So you have to obtain first the sperm concentration before you could calculate for this round cells. And a result of greater than 1 million WBCs per ml per ejaculate means an inflammatory condition. So that could mean infection or poor sperm quality. Now let's have the head abnormalities. So we have... Um, different types of abnormalities in the head. So we have amorphous head, also giant head, and then pin head, double heads, tapered head. So these tapered heads 
usually indicates the presence of varicocele. Remember, you learned this earlier, a varicocele is an enlarged, uh, enlarged scrotal vein. And then also, we could have the constricted heads. So those are the different abnormalities of the sperm heads. Next one, we have tail abnormalities. So we have coiled tails and double tails. And also, we have this immature sperm, the spermatid. Okay, so this one, this shows a spermatozoan with double heads. So this is in hematoxylin eucin stain in times 100, um, uh, 1000 magnification. This one, this is um, a sperm showing or having amorphous head. This one, it shows double tail. Okay, how about this one? You could see spermatids and also bent neck of the sperms. So those are the things that you could observe um, when you are checking for sperm morphology. So again, so for sperm morphology, there must be greater than 50% of the sperm in a semen specimen that should exhibit normal morphology. And um, morphologically abnormal sperm usually have multiple defects. So because of that, we need to get the tetrazoospermic index. So let me write that one. So tetrazoospermic index. So this one refers to the average number of defects per sperm. So again, the average number of what? Of defects per sperm. So we need to get this one. Because again, morphologically abnormal sperm have multiple defects. And also, I've mentioned this, the Kruger strict criteria. So the Kruger um, strict criteria was introduced um, by Kruger and his colleagues. And um, they give the clinically significant threshold of 14% or more for normal forms. So these criteria were based on the measurements taken from spermatozoa that successfully migrated to the cervix. And then the normal sperm morphology as assessed by this Kruger's criteria is also an excellent predictor of in vitro fertilization rates because the in vitro fertilization rates were substantially reduced in individuals with less than 14% um, morphologically normal sperms and it's uh, reduced even more when this percentage is less than four percent like zero to three percent for example so that means probable uh, inability to fertilize whereas this 14 percent or more it's excellent fertilizing capacity so how do we do this one so again to assess the sperm morphology, the sperms are fixed with Papa Nicolau stain. So that's the recommended stain, right? And at least 200 sperms must be counted. And then the criteria for the normal spermatozoan include oval sperm. So that's what you can see here. The shape is oval. And the head, it measures, um, it measures 3 to 5 micrometers. That's in length. And... 2 to 3 micrometers in width. So that's the Kruger's criteria. 3 to 5 micrometers in length. That's the head. And 2 to 3 micrometers width of the head also. And also, you have to examine the, the neck piece and the mid piece and the tail. So there should be no defect in this, um, in this uh, area of the sperm. And also, a well-defined acrosome should comprise 40 to 70% of the sperm head. And other than that, um, the Kruger's criteria also indicate, um, indicates uh, that there should be no cytoplasmic droplets larger than, the half, um, than half the size of the sperm head. So that's for Kruger's strict criteria. So for the sperm vitality, this must be assessed within one hour of ejaculation. So this procedure, I have mentioned this earlier. So the stains, again, are eucin Y and nigrosine. So we will have to count the dead cells in 100 sperm. And again, 
the result would be for the viable sperm or living sperm, they stain bluish white or they are not stained at all. For the non-viable stain, they will be stained red. And for the normal value, so there should be greater than 50% viable sperm. And that the decreased sperm vita uh, vitality may be suspected when a semen specimen has a normal sperm concentration but markedly decreased motility. So we have to perform this one. So again, so if you notice that the sperm concentration is normal but the motility is markedly decreased, you can assess the sperm using sperm vitality test using this eucine nigrosin stain. So this is an example of what you can see under the microscope. So this shows non-viable sperms demonstrated again by eucine nigrosin stain. So this is 1000 magnification. Also this one. So these are dead sperms and these are viable sperms, the one unstained. Also this one dead sperms or non-viable and this one viable sperm how about this one the casa or the computer assisted semen analysis so this one provides objective determination of both velocity and trajectory of the sperm because we have to admit it the analysis of sperm particularly the motility and even the morphology of the sperm is very subjective especially if two medical technologists are examining the same sample so there will be variations among the results of those medical technologies so this one this is objective and this is also very accurate and reliable so this is how it looks like in the laboratory so that is the setup so um, a computer is connected to the microscope and the specimen is placed here and the readings are um, projected on the computer screen so this is just an example of the interface that we can see in CASA. Also this one. So um, the exact um, morphometry data of the sperm or individual sperm, including the head, the length of the head, for example, the width of the head, the area, the perimeter, the percent of acrosome, and the length to width ratio are also um, examined in this CASA. And also, the neck and tail details can be observed. Also, this one, so we can uh, check for the morphology because one problem in sperm analysis, as what I have mentioned, is that often the medical technologist performing the morphology um, determination would not evaluate the semen samples consistently. So there will be, again, variations. And these medical technologies could show a lot of differences in their results when they are assessing the shape or the morphology of the sperm and that two medical technologists for example can give um, results or they can give different results using same sample so that is also a variation however this CASA or computerized semen analysis takes precise measurements to determine what is normal and is therefore uh, far more consistent than a manual analysis. So in this um, technology, we can always be sure that no matter who is performing the semen analysis, the results are going to be consistent from day to day. So that's one of the major advantage of this computer-assisted um, semen analysis. Also this one, we can see this. Now let us have the immunologic test. So the sperm antibodies binding to the head or tail antigens of the sperm is considered specific for immunologic fertility. So we could measure or we could detect the presence of IgA, which is most uh, clinically significant, also the IgG and the IgM. And the current methods of this immunologic test detect sperm-bound antibodies by direct or indirect mixed agglutination reaction test or the MARC test. So this is for the detection of IgG and IgA only. Or we could also use the immunobid assay which detects all classes. So the IgA, IgG, and IgM. And both of these tests, the MARC test and the immuno, uh, immunobid test require motile sperm. And also the MARC test can be performed on fresh semen 
and that the result can be read within a few minutes with an ordinary light microscope. Okay, so let's have the principle of MART test or the mixed agglutination reaction test. So in this procedure, the semen is mixed with latex particles coated with non-specific human IgG. So this is a latex particle and it's coated with non-specific human IgG. And then after that, a monospecific antisera to human IgG is added. So this colored green here, this is a monospecific antisera um, to human IgG. So we call it as anti-IgG. So it is added after the semen is mixed with a latex particle. So if the sperm-bound um, IgG is present, so what will happen is that the anti-IgG will breach the sperm-bound IgG and the particle-bound IgG to form mixed agglutinate. So as what you can see here, the anti-IgG is binding this um, sperm-bound antibody and this um, particle-bound or latex-bound IgG. So it would form, again, mixed agglutinates. However, in the absence of sperm-bound IgG, the anti-IgG will only agglutinate the latex particle. Next one. So this is also a picture showing the um, principle of mixed agglutination reaction. So again, this semen sample containing sperms are mixed with the latex particles coated with nonspecific human IgG. And if the antibodies to the sperm is present, then the anti-IgG will bridge this sperm-bound antibody and particle-bound antibody, causing agglutination. How about for the immunobid technique? So the immunobid assay can detect all three immunoglobulin, so the IgG, IgA, and IgM classes. And when beads are coated with a monospecific antisera to each class, so it could also detect those three antibodies. So in this um, in this procedure, the sperms are washed to remove all free immunoglobulin before the beads are added. And an indirect assay can also be designed with this reagent. And also, this is best examined under a phase contrast microscopy. Now, how about this one, the accessory glands? So the seminal vesicles, the prostate, and the epididymis function can be evaluated by analyzing unique constituents of each gland. So, for example, in the prostate, so the prostate secretions are acidic, right? Because they contain an enzyme, acid phosphatase. And if we observe that the seminal fluid is more alkaline than normal, let's say, for example, it has a pH of greater than 8, then... Um, it could indicate that there is a reduced acid phosphatase secretion from the prostate gland. So that could suggest prostate dysfunction. Also this one, the fructose. So a fructose, that's a measure of a seminal vesicle secretory function. So if there is a zoospermia um, caused by a congenital absence of vas deferens, for example, so a low fructose level may indicate an associated dysgenesis of seminal vesicles. How about this one? In the ejaculatory duct obstruction or a genesis of the vas deferens or the vasa deferentia and seminal vesicles, it may result in the production of semen with low volume, low pH, lack of coagulation, and the absence of characteristic semen odor. So that's for the accessory glands. And also, if multiple semen analysis demonstrate azoospermia, so when we say azoospermia, so let me write that, so azoospermia, then there is no sperm production. Or in cases, for example, of oligo, that's oligospermia, so that means there is a decreased sperm concentration, so uh, less than 20 million per ml of sperm, or let's say other abnormalities. So if there are a lot or multiple abnormalities present, 
then hormone analysis are performed to help identify the specific dysfunction. And an example of a diagnostic algorithm is shown in this figure. Now, let us have the evaluation of female reproductive function. So, for female, the abnormal menstrual cycle pattern is still one of the best predictors of the absence of ovulation or what we call as the anovulation. Okay, so we also have this term, amenorrhea. So, this refers to the absence of menstrual flow by the age of 16 or by age 14 if no breast development occurs. And in patients who have not exhibited menses by the age of 16, this is often due to a genetic or anatomic abnormality. But in such cases, an endocrine abnormality is still a possible cause. And the presence or absence of secondary sexual characteristics such as breast development, development is an important indicator in the evaluation of reproductive function. How about this one? If a woman has a history of menstruation but who has not experienced menses for over three months already, an endocrine abnormality is suspected. Okay, how about this one? So this is an, um, a diagnostic algorithm for amenorrhea. So this is a bit lengthy but this is very helpful in the evaluation of female reproductive function. So this is a stepwise approach to evaluating amenorrhea or absence of menses. So it is usually done by measuring the HCG, the prolactin, the TSH, and also the free T4 level, and also the, uh, the LH level. So we have here the step one, so measurement of HCG. So the, human, uh, the HCG or the human chorionic gonadotropin is measured to exclude the most common cause of secondary amenorrhea. So what's the most common cause of secondary amenorrhea? So it is, it is pregnancy. And as what you can see here, a result of greater than 5 milli international units per ml suggests pregnancy. But you also have to remember that this elevated result can also be obtained with trophoblastic diseases or HCG secreting tumor. So if the HCG is low, so we proceed to the measurement of prolactin, TSH, and 3T4. So these hormones are measured to exclude the endocrine disorders. So for example, we have here on the first um, box here. So there is an increased prolactin, however, the TSH and 3T4 are normal. So what does it indicate? So it indicates prolactinoma. So the 3T4 and TSH are normal and it's only the prolactin that is increased. So it is a possible prolactinoma case. So that means there is a tumor in the pituitary gland that secretes increased levels of prolactin. And this would be further evaluated using imaging techniques. However, it's not all the time that if we see increased levels of prolactin, we could already conclude prolactinoma because hyperprolactinemia or increased prolactin, increased prolactin in the blood can also be caused by thyroid diseases. So for example, in primary hypothyroidism so in primary hypothyroidism the prolactin is also increased and this is also indicated by increased TSH and low FT4 remember it is a primary dysfunction so hypo meaning to say there is a deficient or low levels of hormones so in this case the thyroid um, is involved so, in primary hypothyroidism, the problem lies in the thyroid gland. So, hypo meaning to say there is a decreased production of FT4. So, that now would stimulate the anterior pituitary to increase the production of TSH. That's why you can see this result. Okay? How about in secondary hypothyroidism? So, secondary hypothyroidism. So, in this condition, um, we can observe that both 
the TSH and FT4 are low. So secondary, remember, in secondary um, dysfunction, the problem is in the pituitary gland. So in this case, the pituitary gland fails to produce high levels of TSH. So we have low TSH levels, which leads to low thyroid hormones, particularly the T4. So that's how you would correlate. So if the prolactin level is either high or normal, look at the thyroid condition. So the patient might be experiencing primary hypothyroidism or secondary hypothyroidism. How about in step 3? So if the HCG, the prolactin, TSH, and FT4 are all normal, then endogenous estrogen status is evaluated with what test? So we have here the progest uh, progestin withdrawal test. So this progestin may be administered orally, so orally for 5 to 7 days. So 5 to 7 days, or it could be administered um, intramuscularly once. And how does this work? So this um, progestin withdrawal test, so let me just show you here. So this is the procedure involved for progestin withdrawal test. So again, the progestin or the oral medroxyprogesterone acetate is administered for 5 to 7 days. So let me just correct that one. So 5 to 7 days orally or um, intramuscularly one time. And then after administration, you have to look for withdrawal bleeding after the progestin is withdrawn or the administration of um, progestin is finished. But before that, what is this progestin? What is its function? So these progestins are synthetic forms of progesterone. So that means they are designed to interact with progesterone receptors in the body in order to cause progesterone-like effects. So this means they do some of what the body's natural progesterone does. So do you still remember the function of progesterone? So progesterone thickens the endometrial lining in preparation for a possible pregnancy. So if this um, synthetic progestin is administered, what will happen now? So the endometrial lining will thicken. And then take note, progestin withdrawal. So there will come a time that this progestin will be, um, will be stopped or the progestin administration will be finished. So, what will um, we have to check after that? So, we have to check for withdrawal bleeding. So, this withdrawal bleeding is observed after the progesterone or progestin cessation. So, what is a positive response? So, a positive response shows a bleeding, um, more than light spotting that occurs within two weeks after the progestin is given and that the bleeding will usually occur two to seven days after the progestin is finished. So what does it indicate if there is withdrawal bleeding? So that means the outflow tract is intact and sufficient estrogen was present to stimulate endometrial growth. Remember, it's not only the progesterone that um, stimulates the lining of the endometrium. And this test now, if there is withdrawal bleeding, demonstrates that that woman builds up a lining in her uterus. So that means she bleeds after the progestin is withdrawn, showing that it is the lack of ovulation that is causing her not to have periods. So that's for a positive withdrawal bleeding. Next one, how about if um, you did not observe withdrawal bleeding. So maybe there is low estrogen levels or the outflow tract is compromised, such as there is cervical stenosis or scarring, or probably there is primary ovarian failure. So that is the principle of progestin withdrawal test. So let me just go back to um, the diagram. Okay, so I hope you follow me in this one. How about in step 4? So we already are in step 4. So 
the serum FSH and levels should also be determined. So as what you can see here, FSH and LH are determined particularly if withdrawal bleeding is absent. And if you could see results such as elevated FSH and LH, so if both are high, it could indicate primary ovarian failure. Whereas if um, they are low or normal, it could indicate secondary ovarian failure. Remember the primary and the secondary dysfunction. How about this step five? So the androgen excess should also be evaluated if withdrawal bleeding is present because elevated testosterone could also indicate an ovarian tumor or PCOS or the polycystic ovarian syndrome. This PCOS here, so that PCOS um, is a clinical entity um, associated with enlarged ovaries and infertility as well as amenorrhea. How about this one? DHEAS. Do you still remember this one? Dehydroepiandrosterone sulfate. So, this could also suggest adrenal tumor. So this must also be evaluated, especially if the levels are increased. And also the 17-hydroxy progesterone, if it is high, so that means um, there could be an adrenal hyperplasia or the levels of this um, hormone could um, indicate congenital or adult onset um, adrenal hyperplasia because of 21 hydroxylase deficiency. So I still hope you remember the um, steroid, uh, steroidogenic pathway. And also these, um, these abnormalities may be accompanied by hirsutism. So I have also introduced that term um, before. So that hirsutism is a male pattern of hair growth in females. So this is for algorithm for aminorrhea. So I hope you understand, uh, understand this one. So one of the methods used to confirm ovulation is the measurement of basal body temperature. So a rise in progesterone after ovulation increases the basal body temperature by 0.4 to 0.8 degree Fahrenheit. How about for ovulation? So women who want to get pregnant would usually purchase um, ovulation kits or ovulation LH test strips in the market. This could measure also the urinary LH by colorimetric assay. And um, you have to remember that LH has a short half-life. So it is rapidly excreted in the urine. And in most cases, the test will be positive for only one day of the menstrual cycle and the testing should be started two to three days before the LH surge and should be continued daily. How about for the serum progesterone? So another method that is reliable and also widely available involves the measurement of the mid luteal phase serum progesterone levels on day 21 of the menstrual cycle and that values above 3 nanograms per ml indicate ovulation and also the production of progesterone by the corpus luteum. However, if there is inadequate progesterone levels, that now result, um, um, I mean, that now uh, be a cause of luteal phase deficiency. So that means maturation of the secretory endometrium is delayed so that implantation of the blastocyst does not occur. So there will be no pregnancy. How about this one, FSH levels. So when the diagnosis of ovarian failure is suspected, the levels of FSH in the early follicular phase, particularly on day three, should be determined. And concentrations greater than 10 milli international units per ml are associated with diminished ovarian reserve. So, which is defined by low numbers of normal oocytes, so this one, so low numbers of normal oocytes and the presence of poor quality oocytes. So, diminished um, ovarian reserve is associated with decreased probability of live birth with a natural pregnancy or um, IVF um, method. 
next one, we have the estradiol level. So additional information can also be obtained by the measurement of estradiol levels on the same day of each menstrual cycle. And levels greater than 80 picograms per ml are considered abnormal and indicate ovarian stimulation of steroidogenesis by elevated FSH and also um, typically seen in ovarian failure. Now let us have the assisted reproductive technology. So ARTs involve techniques of direct manipulation of the oocytes just like um, in this picture. And these are performed to control as much of the reproductive process as possible in order to achieve pregnancy and, of course, bring it to term. And we also have another term here, infertility. So this refers to one year of unprotected intercourse without conception. So that's why some couples would resort to ARTs. So these ARTs include um, the following functions. So they are indicated whenever there is male infertility, ovarian failure, unexplained infertility, tubal disease, and endometriosis. So there are also different forms of ARTs as stated in here, and it is the in vitro fertilization that is the most common. Other forms involve gamete intrafallopian transfer, zygote intrafallopian transfer, and tubal embryo transfer. And all procedures are performed with the use of laparoscopy. So what is this laparoscopy? So laparoscopy is a type of um, surgical procedure that allows a surgeon to access the inside of the abdomen and also the pelvis without having to make large incisions in the skin. So this procedure is also known as keyhole surgery. So keyhole surgery or minimally invasive surgery. And then the typical ART protocol contains four steps. So we have the step one, ovarian hyperstimulation. So there is an administration of exogenous gonadotropin in this step. For, uh, for step two, retrieval of oocytes from ovaries. So we have here. Step three, fertilization in the laboratory. And step four, transfer of embryos in the uterus. So initially, a GnRH analog may be given to suppress FSH and LH. So let me write that one. So to suppress FSH and LH, what will be given is a GnRH analog. So usually it's Lopron. So this is a GnRH Analog. So that functions again to downregulate the FSH and LH secretion by initially inducing its hypersecretion. However, ultimately, it will result in their depletion. So the FSH and LH will be decreased. And then, once um, um, this is already given, the Lupron is administered, um, the next step is to stimulate follicular growth using a human menopausal gonadotropin preparation. That's why we have here exogenous gonadotropin. So we have the administration of human menopausal gonadotropin. So we will add here gonadotropin. And this human menopausal gonadotropin preparation will have FSH and LH activity. So predominantly, FSH activity depending on the specific material used. And unlike, um, unlike in the normal reproductive cycle in which um, typically only one dominant follicle matures, in ART cycle, multiple follicles undergo growth and maturation. And the number of follicles in their increase in size are monitored by regular um, ultrasound analysis. And also, aside from that, the function of the developing follicles is monitored by sequential serum estradiol measurement. So first, again, Lupron is given and then also administration of human menopausal gonadotropin preparation in order to um, help in the maturation of the follicles. 
So now, when sufficient follicular maturation is achieved after these two steps, and um, an HCG is administered. So let me add here HCG. So this HCG functions as a surrogate LH surge. So that means it will interact with LH receptors. So what will it do? So after it interacts with LH receptors, it will initiate the process of ovulation. However, the process of ovulation is not allowed to progress to completion. Remember, ovulation would um, normally occur um, approximately 48 hours after HCG administration. So that means 12 hours before induced ovulation, the oocytes are already retrieved from the stimulated follicle. So that is now the step two. So again, um, after this HCG um, binds to the LH receptors and um, triggers, um, triggers of ovulation, um, this ovulation will not be completed. And then it will now proceed to step two, the retrieval of oocytes from the ovaries. And then each oocyte is mixed with the sperm. So there is now fertilization in the laboratory. And depending on the type of ART used, the gametes may be transferred immediately to the fallopian tube or they may be incubated together for up to 48 hours resulting uh, and the resulting zygos or embryos are transferred to the fallopian tubes or uterus. So that's for ART protocol. Now let us have the laboratory evaluation of pregnancy. So as what you can see here, I have the summary of laboratory procedures used routinely to monitor pregnancy. Next one for HCG and early pregnancy. So elevated HCG in the maternal serum and also in urine sample is a reliable indicator of pregnancy and the discovery of monoclonal antibodies led to the development of a simple and cheap immunoassays such as this one, agglutination inhibition assays and also sandwich enzyme link immunosorbent assay or the ELISA technique. For the serum HCG, so currently most serum assays measure both the free beta subunit and the intact HCG, which is the alpha plus beta subunit. So utilizing two different antibodies directed at different epitopes of the beta subunits. And this can quantify HCG as low as 1 to 2 MIU per ml. And the normal range for this one is 4 to 6. MIU per ml, and the serum HCG increases above the reference interval, um, usually um, during implantation and um, 6 to 12 days after ovulation. Next one, urine HCG. So urine assays um, use one antibody directed at the beta subunit and the other antibody directed at the alpha subunit. So that means this allows the, um, the measurement of intact HCG and also the fragments that appear in the urine. And the urine HCG levels are commonly measured by qualitative immunoassay test kits with detection limits of approximately 20 MIU per ml, or that's milli international units per ml. And these methods can detect elevated urine HCG that's two to three days, two to three days after the serum method. And also the qualitative assays are meant for home use can have a detection limit of about 50, so 50 MIU per ml only. So it can detect elevated levels of, um, I mean it can detect elevated urine levels several days later or shortly after the first Menses. Now let us have neural tube defects. So NTDs are conditions that result from failure of the neural tube to close by the 27th day after conception. So we have two types, anencephaly and spina bifida. So as what you can see in the picture, there is a baby 
that has anencephaly. So this anencephaly comprises 50% of the neural tube disorders. So anencephaly is a serious birth defect in which a baby is born without parts of the brain and the skull. So it involves the absence of the calvarium, the cranial vault, and also the cerebral hemisphere. So that means it is incompatible with life. Also, we have spina bifida. So this refers to the abnormalities of the caudal portion of the neural tube. And um, it could present as a lumbar or cervical meningo meyelocele with herniation of meninges, spinal cord, and nerve roots. That's why they are protruding in here. So the complications involve paralysis or muscle weakness, and also fecal or urinary incontinence, and also intellectual impairment. Next, what are the screening tests for NPDs? So we have number one, the AFP, or alpha fetoprotein. So this is produced initially by the fetal yolk sac and later by the fetal liver, and it is the most abundant protein in fetal serum. However, its concentration is decreased um, gradually, and um, the liver would now shift to the production of another protein, the production of albumin. So the peak of production of this alpha fetoprotein is 13 to 14 weeks of gestation. So again, after which its levels um, in, a, uh, in a mutic fluid begin to decline. And also in NPDs, as what I have indicated in here, the AFP becomes elevated because um, the fetal serum from exposed neural membranes and blood vessels leak into the amniotic fluid. So that means the concentration of the, AF, um, of the AFP in the amniotic fluid is approximately less than the fetal serum. So that's 100-fold less than the fetal serum. So again, in amniotic fluid, so let me write that one, the concentration of AFP is less than the fetal serum. Again, that's 100 times less than the fetal serum. And also, small amounts of AFP are transferred across the placenta from the fetal serum and also across the amniotic membranes from the amniotic fluid to the maternal serum. So for the maternal serum, the concentration of AFP is also less than compared to the concentration of AFP in the amniotic fluid. So now it's less than 1,000 fold as compared to the amniotic fluid. So next we have in the second trimester. So the maternal serum AFP is increased by approximately 15% per gestational week. And then um, the AFP levels are decreasing also due to combined changes in the transfer to maternal serum and maternal clearance. So elevated amniotic fluid levels of AFP should also be followed by measurement of amniotic acetylcholinesterase. So th uh, this is an enzyme, so it's more specific for neural tube disorders than AFP. Now let us have the Down syndrome. So this Down syndrome is a condition in which a child is born with an extra copy of chromosome 21. That's why the other name for this is trisomy 21. So this condition causes physical and mental developmental delays and disabilities. And on the picture here, you can see the characteristic feature of the patient or the child with down syndrome. So this is very common. That's why all women should be screened for fetal chromosomal abnormalities before age 20 weeks, regardless of maternal age. Next one, we also have the term nuchal translucency. So this nuchal translucency is an ultrasonographic um, marker. So it is a sonographic appearance of a collection of the fluid under the skin behind the fetal neck in the first trimester of pregnancy. So this is indicative of Down syndrome, whereas this one, this is normal, nuchal translucency. So for nuchal translucency, 
an increase in size of this nuchal translucency is characteristic of fetal chromosomal and structural abnormalities. And it has a detection rate of 64 to 70 percent in Down syndrome, trisomy 20, uh, 18, trisomy 13, and Turner's syndrome. And also, we could add the calculation of serum pap A. So this pap A. So that is pregnancy associated plasma protein A. And also the measurement of beta HCG. So this would improve the detection rate to 82 to 87 percent. Next one, we have erythroblastosis fetalis. So I know you are already familiar with this one because we have tackled this in your immunohematology. So severe hemo uh, hemolytic disease in fetus and marked by anemia and also accompanied by normoblastic hyperplasia can occur. So since there is normoblastic hyperplasia, we call it as erythroblastosis. So this can also be followed by congestive heart failure. That's why we also call it hydrops fetalis. And eventually, this could lead to intrauterine death. So what's the most common cause of this erythroblastosis fetalis? So usually, it is caused by the production of the antibodies from a mother who is negative for Rh antigen. So in this picture, you can see that an Rh negative woman and an Rh positive man conceive a child. So that means the baby followed the Rh of the father. So the mother is Rh negative and the baby is Rh positive. So the Rh antigen from this fetus will now enter the bloodstream or the circulation of the mother. So that would trigger the release of antibodies from the mother. So the mother will produce antibodies against this Rh antigen. But also, you have to take note that this is not that harmful in the first pregnancy because there is still sensitization that is happening. So meaning, there is a gradual production of antibodies. However, um, in second and subsequent pregnancy, this is already harmful because um, the maternal antibody can readily attack the fetal red blood cells. So that could lead to anemia or hemolytic disorders and other complications. Next one, to detect this erythroblastosis fetalis, we have the spectral analysis at 450 nanometer. So this has been the accepted method of assessing the severity of erythroblastosis in the uterus. So normally, um, a fetus with hemolytic disease does not develop increased bilirubin, uh, bilirubin in the blood and they don't um, become jaundiced because the placenta normally removes the bilirubin. However, there are still bilirubin that would leak into the amniotic fluid. So that's why we use this analysis. So the specimen for this one is an amniotic fluid, so approximately 5 ml, and the light absorbance of the amniotic fluid is scanned continuously between wavelengths 350 nanometer and 750 nanometer, and a spectrophotometric curve can be used to determine whether or not the fluid contains bilirubin and or other pigmented products of hemolysis. So I hope you still remember the principle of spectrophotometry. So this one shows a graph for the interpretation of net absorbance at 450 nanometer of amniotic fluid. Okay, another one, we have the MCA Doppler. So the current um, trend in the management of RH immunization is the use of Doppler measurements of peak systolic velocity in the fetal mid, uh, middle cerebral artery. So this is middle cerebral artery. So this is accurate and non-invasive method for assessing and monitoring the degree of fetal anemia in pregnancies complicated by RH immunization. And also based on this MCA drop, uh, Doppler, so a value above 1.5 MOM, so 1.5 MOM, so that's multiples of the median, 
for the gestational age, um, age um, it detects all cases of anemia. And also a rise in peak velocity of fetal MCA greater than 5 uh, multiples of the median is an indication for fetal blood sampling. That's greater than 5 uh, multiples of the median. Next one, we have the fetal lung maturity. So the fetal lung maturation is marked by the production of surface active phospholipid compounds. So we call it surfactants. So we have here um, the term surfactants. So this surfactant um, is a substance that normally appears in mature lungs and allows the alveoli to remain open throughout the cycle of inhalation and exhalation. So that means it decreases the surface tension of the alveoli and of course it allows the alveoli to inflate with air more easily. So that means it prevents the alveolar collapse during expiration. So that's the function of surfactant. And in FLM, so um, we can use this to detect the maturity of the lungs of the fetus. So anyway, this Surfactant is produced by type 2 pneumocytes in the form of lamellar bodies. So, in short, the lung surfactants are stored as lamellar bodies. So, lamellar bodies are about the size of platelets. And during the third trimester, the lamellar bodies reach levels of about 50,000 to 200,000 cells per UL. So this counts um, provide a reliable estimate of fetal lung maturity. So this is also done um, before or um, before delivery, so usually less than 39 weeks. So these are the fetal lung sur surfactants. We have the lecithin, fingomelin, and phosphatidyl glycerol. And also a decrease in surfactant leads to respiratory distress syndrome. So this is a disorder that results in hypoxia, um, acidemia, and also vascular protein transudation into the alveolar air spaces. So we call it as hyaline membrane disease. So again, neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. Next one, we have the lecithin sphingomelin ratio. So the LS ratio, in short, so um, prior to 35th weeks of gestation, the LS ratio is less than 1.6. So that's because large amount of lecithin is not produced at this time. So that's why you have values of less than 1.6. And in 33rd weeks, um, the levels of the two, phospholipid, uh, two phospholip phospholipids, the lecithin and sphingomelin, are relatively equal. However, after 34 weeks, the levels of lecithin increases and sphingomelin decreases. That's why um, after 34 weeks, the LS ratio must be greater than 2 to indicate fetal pulmonary system maturity. But if it is less than 1.5, then this is indicative of immaturity. Anyway, lecithin is the primary component of the surfactants and account for alveolar stability. That's why we measure this one. So these are the references. So I hope you learned something. Thank you very much for listening. Have a good day.